Copy. and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sands. My name's Brent, I have Brian on the thumb on camera, uh, and we have Scott and Andrew on the other vehicle, and Nikki and Eugene in final control. Welcome to a very chilly uh, Juma Private Game Reserve this morning. It's 14 degrees Celsius, 50, uh, sorry, 13 degrees Celsius, 55 Fahrenheit, and I think that's the coldest morning we've had uh, so far this winter. As you can see, gloves are on, very chilly. Um, just to let you know what's been happening, well, I woke up at about half past four this morning and I could hear lions calling um, to our sort of northeast. We've headed into the area. Unfortunately, it looks like they are further north. There are no tracks in the area. But um, I know there was a report of a male leopard around the waterhole cam, and I know Scott's in that area having a look. Oh, we've got a heron flying in. As you can see, very misty morning. Uh, we were with that poor lone male hippo at Buffalo Hook Dam, and now we've got a grey heron. I hope he's going to come and land quite close to us. Oh, behind the bush. Pop. So, um, we've been sitting here quietly, again trying to see if those lines roar. Uh, unfortunately they haven't, as you can see the mist on the horizon, uh, chilly, chilly morning, and when we're looking at that hippo, you can actually see the heat of its breath uh, coming out, um, he's not turned to face us, but I think we're going to continue on uh, and see if we can find any other tracks or any other animals, quite still morning because of the cold, but that's good for the cats. For those of you who might be uh, new to Safari Live, um, we are live, so you are actually seeing everything we're seeing at the same time as us, uh, and also we are interactive, so you're able to send us questions uh, while we're out in the African bush looking for animals, and you can do that uh, by using the email address questions at wildearth.tv, or you can use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. towards our eastern boundary now. Um, the lion roaring I heard was only one male um, and we did have the, the Styx lionesses and, the, and two Matimbas uh, in, our, in our southeastern corner yesterday morning. So it is possible that some of them might still be around there but I think the male lion we heard calling earlier this morning is definitely further to our northeast from here. I love 
being out first in the morning um, and being able to see all the tracks that have been left overnight uh, gives us a nice sort of idea about what's been happening during the evening uh, and what areas we can work in. And sometimes we're lucky in there, the animals will make a, enough noise to let us know what area they're in, like those lions this morning. the game drive radio making quite a lot of noise first thing in the morning uh, so everyone's getting out planning what areas they're going to work uh, we'll all chat quite a bit to to figure out how to cover uh, the most ground and give us the best chance uh, for finding animals mastered the use of the new digital radios. Bit of a Luddite when it comes to that. but one of the harder ones to grab on camera and disappeared. Uh, a little female grey diker. Maybe she stopped a little bit further away. Unfortunately not. check these road junctions very carefully. Lion and Leopard very fond of using roads as highways to move around the reserve. We've got a sneaky suspicion that line we heard calling, we might see his tracks on our eastern boundary. tracks. Station on Chiricat line coming. Morning takes what's your route? sure it is the Angala that was colouring last night. Yeah, uh, 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 
Okay, copy, thanks. Text. Oh, there we go. As I expected from all that calling this morning, there's that. Two male lines are to the east of us here. Uh, this is the general area where I thought they were calling. I was hoping they're a little bit closer to our boundary, but unfortunately not. I'm just going to have a quick word with the guys to find out whether they are moving this way. Ephraim coming. Morning. Morning for well done. Um, how far are they from Chile Cut Line? Copy, thanks very much. No, they're a bit far, so we're gonna move out of the area and see what else we can find. from Texas. Oh, welcome on the Sunrise Safari and there it comes to, true to its word. Um, Jeffrey would like to know, have there been any records of big cats being infected with canine distemper? Um, Jeffrey, as far as I'm aware, even if they do contract it, it doesn't seem to be harm them too adversely. Um, canine distemper affects wild dogs very, very badly and jackal, but uh, not as far as I know, not the big cats. Uh, the disease that's uh, most common in big cats in the in the Kruger region is. Uh, feline tuberculosis and they get that from bovine tuberculosis from feeding off buffalo uh, and it manifests in, in growths generally on the elbows and stuff and can um, in younger animals uh, cause them to, to to die before getting a bit older and also in older animals cause them to uh, have a slightly shorter lifespan <laughs> this morning. Well, what I consider cold is probably nice and warm for a winter temperature for a lot of uh, you guys in the northern hemisphere. But while we are meandering down this long straight boundary road, Let's see. Uh, I think I see one now. Nice, easy quiz to start off the morning. Let everyone wake up a little bit. We have a tree directly in front of us on the left. There's a couple of them around. This one is actually being debarked by elephants. Um, but we should still be able to tell what type of tree it is from the general, from the bark uh, and the general shape. Uh, there's one with leaves behind it, but we'll look at this one now. Very distinct bark. Percy and Lee departing on morning safari. We've made it 30 feet out of the driveway because we're just discussing sex in scorpions and spiders. 
So if we have a look to the right, there's two others there that have some leaves on them. They are losing their leaves at the moment. There's two there. Nice big trees, one of the more common of the larger tree species we get here in the Sabi Sands. So let's see, who can tell me what type of trees these are? You can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Hi Cindy, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Uh, Cindy is a vet tech from Arizona and has been wondering if anyone's seen Mbula uh, and if his eye is, is feeling better. Um, we haven't. We tracked him uh, yesterday off our property, uh, off our Travis area. Um, I don't know if he was seen to the south of us, uh, but I'm pretty sure from what I saw uh, of that, it looks like more like a burst blood vessel than anything else. Nothing too serious. I've seen it quite often in leopards, so I wouldn't worry too much, Cindy. I think he's going to... I think he'll pull through from that. Uh, he's, uh, he's possibly, there's a couple of ways he possibly got that injury. Um, he could have got it from while mating, as leopard mating can be quite an aggressive affair. Um, the other possibility is fighting uh, with uh, another male for territory, or he could have just injured it while he was hunting um, and taken a blow from a hoof or whatnot to the side of his head, which would have caused that blood vessel to burst. But I'm pretty sure he will come right from that without too much problem. Thanks very much for that question, Cindy. Uh, hopefully we, we find him soon and we'll be able to clarify that ourselves. safari yesterday um, this is the area where we had the those um, matimba males and sticks lionesses and then they crossed south directly south opposite here and then it looks like they've to our right you can see the mist really settling in down there um, and Brian and I have got all our warm kit on because we're about to drop into that mist belt uh, around the Mulawati River system and twin dams in that area and hopefully we have some luck no gorillas in the mist here but hopefully we find some leopards or lions in the mist or elephants any animal. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll take an impala about now. We haven't even seen one of those yet this morning. I do really love these early misty mornings. What are you shouting at, Squirrely? Are you just happy about waking up? Yeah, it looks like that. More talking than alarm calling. We just moved so we can get it. It's 
pause and to listen to all the sounds in the bush. Brian, full scrolls, if we go to that Combretum, in the middle of that tall Combretum there's a woodpecker. So there we go. There's a little woodpecker. And we're going to it's a nice one. It's a very nice one to see. Um, so I'm going to see who can tell me which species of woodpecker this is. Oh. And off it goes. And it's landed again quite close by. Um, so who can tell me which woodpecker species this is? I uh, can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Which woodpecker species is this? Well, well done to Gilly and Shanae, um, who have got that tree 100% correct. There are quite a few others, but they were the, the, the first off the, the blocks. Uh, Gilly and Shanae, it was a marilla tree. Sunrise Safari. Um, Savannah would like to know whether I prefer these nice cold early mornings or uh, the warmer late afternoon drives. Well, Savannah, I love both, to be honest. Um, they offer very different things, and one of the, the nicer things about the morning is that you've got this fresh tapestry of tracks to work with. Um, in the afternoon, uh, it's a bit more difficult. Obviously, a lot of the predators don't move around as much. But uh, the one thing that is nice is the morning can set you up for the afternoon. So you can use the morning. You can figure out, even if you don't find um, the animal, there's going to be a lot of tracks in an area. So you have a really good idea of where you want to work in the afternoon. And especially as it gets to that last sort of half an hour um, before sunset and after sunset, um, you've got a good chance if you're in that area that uh, some of your more uh, interesting species are going to be moving around. So I do love both and for different reasons. Um, but yeah, you could, I could never choose between which is my favorite. Um, but when it comes to mornings, when there's mist, for some reason, I, I really love the misty mornings. They're also really great from a photographic point of view, which is probably why I, I really do enjoy them. And there's something quite sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Primordial uh, about these mist, misty mornings. You can see it's almost a layer in front of me there now. And we're going to dive into the mist, see what we can find. stop shortly and listen again for a little bit uh, and we'll also have a look at that woodpecker we've had a few answers in already uh, guys are on the ball this morning quick but uh I 
So well done to Chris, um, who was 100% correct on that woodpecker. It was the bearded woodpecker, and it was a female. And you can see one of the distinguishing features, a very black and white head um, on the female and lacks the red cap of the male. So a female bearded woodpecker and it's also quite a big woodpecker. That was another sort of giveaway. Well done, Chris. Just listening for a little bit. Hoping to hear some clues. Oh, I got it. Sat it there for a second. Uh, it saw a lion track on the road, but then it, it was the line. This is where we had the lions yesterday. So. You'll notice I turn off the engine quite often when I've, I've got a hill to run down. Um, and that's just to help me possibly hear alarm calls or vocalizations of animals. Uh, gives us a better chance of being able to find. Find all the animals we're looking for. to head towards um, Twin Dams at the moment. Quite a popular thoroughfare uh, from the south as the road that comes through from our southern boundary into, into the Twin Dams area. So always a good spot to look for um, animals. We're about to go through a little dip. There might be slight bit of signal break, so I'll just start chatting when I come up on the other side. As I said, quite, an, quite a popular thoroughfare for lion and leopard. Unfortunately, it looks like no one's been using the highway today. Nothing here at Twin Dams yet today, um, so we're going to cross across to Scotty so he can say good morning uh, and see what he's been up to. And we'll be back with you a little later. Welcome on board, everyone. And, uh, hope you've been enjoying your morning with Brent and Brian so far. Myself and Andrew have been following up on some reports of leopard seen on the Juma waterhole camera last night. So thanks very much to Ray, Chris and John for sending through those very valuable updates to us. Now, sadly, we have not managed to find the leopards that were allegedly seen. We're not sure if it was one or two leopards, but there was definitely a leopard at the Juma waterhole last night. I couldn't establish where the tracks headed from there, and we've just looped around the block 
hoping to find some tracks and we have found tracks of a, a male leopard heading down this road in the same direction that we're traveling in who knows which leopard it is but it looks like a large male so we'll continue following these tracks to the best of our ability and see where they take us At this road junction up ahead, I'm just going to jump out quickly. Okay. And Brent and I are on, are on opposite ends of the property now, which is great because we're essentially dividing and conquering, and hopefully, well, we've divided. We haven't conquered yet, but hopefully that's the plan. This male leopard's tracks are very difficult to see, but they do continue down this road. I think it could be a different male to the one that was allegedly seen at the Juba Waterhole last night. But it's impossible to say. They can move big distances in short spaces of time, and it could be that this is the very same leopard that was seen there that's just moved up in this direction. some elephant tracks around here so also good signs that will hopefully lead to some animals being spotted later on on the drive uh oh the leopard appears to have veered off this road he could come back on but I would just like to show you these tracks Just trying to get the vehicle into position, which I'm making a meal of. But those little smudges you can see in the sand are the tracks of the leopard. Well done there, Andrew. Heading off in the wrong direction. So that is no, no go zone for us. But we will just carry on a little bit and see. He doesn't, in fact, veer back onto the road, which it looks like has happened. So, we're back in action. The tracks have come back out onto this road. And interestingly enough, it looks like this could be tracks of a female now. So, possibly a male and a female interacting. Wouldn't that be great to see? The only time you typically find male and female leopards together is when they are mating, but it's not cast in stone. I just find it interesting that the male tracks have disappeared and the female tracks have not arrived. Anyway, good prospects. The tracks are heading down in this direction. This is our northern boundary. But there's nothing to say that the leopards didn't veer left into Vuyatela. And that's what we are going to be hoping for. There's been a lot of really interesting movements of the leopards as well as the lions operation that's keeping us all guessing we're not sure what is causing these or exactly what's causing these changes in territory that we have been witnessing but it is normal for animals territories to vary in size and um, Andrew's just got some Egyptian geese flying past Tracks of both the female 
and the male leopard heading down this road. Clearly just telling from the size difference of the tracks. So good prospects. But it's interesting now, I can just see the male's tracks and I can't see the female's tracks that I was seeing earlier, but they could be zigzagging. And they could also be very nearby, which is what I'm hoping for. The tricky thing about following tracks is you just don't know how far in front of you the animals are, or I don't. Some master trackers may be able to estimate and guess as to how fresh tracks may be, but it's not an easy business. I can guarantee you is at the end of these tracks there will be a leopard. It's just about trying to find where the end of the tracks are, which can be a little bit tricky. <coughs> Those of you who may be joining for the first time, a very, very warm welcome. And just to let you know, this is a live safari experience. So this is happening this very second. Nothing is scripted or, or planned. We have plans, but there's a limit to how well we can enforce those plans because we rely on the animals a lot of the time for our plans to work out. Not only is it a live safari, but it's also interactive, so you can ask us questions at any stage. And to do that, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. So send your questions through, whatever they may be. Oh, the tracks appear to have... Oh no, they're still here. It's just tracks of a male leopard now heading down this road. So I'm not sure what happened to the female's tracks that did appear onto the road very briefly. Now what is going to happen at this major intersection? Will the leopard veer into our property? Oh no, it's gone out. But who knows, it could veer back onto this road. Andrew has already found the tracks and aren't those beautiful, crisp, clear tracks. You can clearly see the three lobes on the back pad. And if you look at that little back pad over there, tracks, uh, you can see the three pads and then the main four main toes main. leading around to the front edge of that track. And as Andrew zooms out, you'll see that the tracks all veer up to the right and to the north out of our property, which is a great pity because those tracks look very, very fresh. But let's go up ahead a little bit. It's not uncommon for leopards to veer off in one direction and then... change direction and head in the opposite way. Well, good morning to Jeffrey and t in Texas, and thanks so much for sending your question through. Jeffrey would like to know, when was the last time that the quarantine young male leopard was seen? And I stand to be corrected, Jeffrey, but it was sometime around probably just before or in and around the 8th or 9th of, uh, or 9th or 10th of 
uh, the the previous month. Where, what month are we in now? I'm losing track of things. We're in May now. May now yeah. It was in May. Yeah. It was it was early May. Yeah. So it was early May, Jeffrey, and I think it was Peter Pretorius that was lucky enough to be the last person to see quarantine. Since then, him and his brother haven't been seen on our property. They were seen on surrounding properties, but even the surrounding properties that border us haven't had visuals of them recently. That's not to say they have disappeared or moved out of this territory, even though they are expected to at this stage of their life. They have become sexually mature, or are in the process of becoming sexually mature, rather, and need to go and find their own territory, move out of mom and dad's territory, and... Even though that it, we are in the right stage to expect them moving off, I don't expect them to just disappear in an instant. And just like the leopard we've been tracking this morning, and just like a lot of the times we track animals, we often don't find them. That's not to say they're not here. It just means we can't find them. There are many, many hiding places within the blocks uh, that the roads surround that are very difficult to get into and difficult to search for leopard in. And let's be honest, even if the leopard was lying right on the side of the road, we could drive past it. So, they're not gone, I don't think. That leopard over there is gone because he's walked out of our property. So we know that, and that's not a problem because we can go and look for other leopard. Apologies for the Game Drive channel that sometimes you'll hear quite loudly. Um, we, it's a new system and we don't yet have earpieces for them. And to control the volume is really difficult on them because they're either too loud or too soft. But it is imperative for us to be able to communicate on them. So it's just something that we all have to deal with for the time being. But I apologize for that. Gonzo for my daughter Ingwe via north of Buffalo's of Cut Line towards Hardacool sign, the Hardacool Buffalo's of Sandboard. tracks that we did see there but cannot be certain and it was believed that Mvula was the leopard seen around the Juma waterhole there a couple of hours ago sadly though it appears our timing was off but there's lots of other animals around so don't worry about anything. We shouldn't become despondent just because we didn't find one animal that we may be looking for. Okay, we need a quick link. Friends found something awesome. We'll see you later. Enjoy. I wish I was there. <laughs> Um, we've been looking for a lion and leopard and we found a, a Schneebel's blind snake. Let me just try and move so we can see it again a bit better. Quite unusual to see them um, at this time of the year and in this temperature. Um, they normally, you see them quite often after the, the rains um, when they get pushed out of their holes by the water. He's moving towards us, so completely blind. So he's cruising um, through there by a sense of smell mostly. And you can see his, ta his tongue was flicking out. Oh, he's coming, don't go under the car. Sorry about that. So, is that okay there? Yeah. And you watch his tongue flick out, testing, testing. Now, let's see, um, can, who can tell me what these guys eat? Um, Schlieven's blind snake, very, very pretty. It's almost gold, the color on his skin. Very spotty, very distinctive snake. Um, 
And you can see he's a blind snake. Uh, when we get close to his head, he's got no eyes. Also, his body shape is quite different. You see, he doesn't have that long, elongated tail. He's almost the same size all the way through. And uh, let's see if you guys can tell me what the snake eats mostly. Now, uh, you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So what he'll probably be doing now is the first available hole he finds, he'll disappear down, or she. I'm just driving down the road and I actually just caught the glint um, of the sun off the scales is how I spotted it. Oh, has it found a hole? Nope, not yet. Uh, I might find a hole there. And that's going to be the end of that. They're non-venomous, uh, so you can actually pick them up and handle them. Um, I don't personally like um, picking up and handling animals, um, interfering in their routine. Um, there we go. It's, it looks like it definitely found a hole. And they're very vulnerable when they're above ground, so it would be quite happy to go back underground. I feel a lot more comfortable. It's going quite slowly, making sure there's not something else down the hole. There's quite a lot of snakes that eat other snakes. Uh, your cobras are very fond of eating other snakes. Or maybe the hole's dead end. <laughs> Can't fit. <laughs> Maybe there's been a collapse. Maybe he's happy like that. Yes. <laughs> Don't think so. That tail will be a very, very tempting treat to a snake eagle or any of the other little raptors or even a slender mongoose. Oh, maybe there's something else down the hole he doesn't like. Sunrise Safari. Uh, Remo or Remy would like to know whether the snake sheds. Yes, most definitely. Um, all snake species will shed. Yeah, I'm living in Papaya. I'm still in Papaya. I'm still in Papaya. Oh, something going on down there. I'm eating south. Join Zanibane East. I'd like to check who's going to be playing north. It's quite difficult to try to work out what's going on when you can't see under the ground. But something has stopped going into that hole and there was quite a sharp little jerk there. What is going on down there? Go ahead. As I say, we normally see these snakes uh, in the summer months. They're not very common. Obviously, snakes that live underground are seen less than the, the snakes that live up on top of the ground. But as I said, most of the time I've seen them is after very heavy rains where they've been pushed out of the ground. So it is quite unusual uh, to see this, them at this time of the year. Maybe it's just clearing a blockage in the tunnel. Definitely going to be far more comfortable uh, below ground, and, and it's also very cold this morning. Uh, so it's quite, it is quite unusual to see them. Almost disappeared. <laughs> And 
So a very unusual shape that doesn't have that long extended tail. It's almost the same size all the way through. Awesome. All gone. Well, that was really nice. That was quite a rare sighting. It's not something we see too often, and especially not at this time of the year. Well, just to let you know, um, before we spotted that little fella, um, uh, we were following the tracks of a, a male leopard. Um, unfortunately, uh, like the tracks of the male leopard Scott were following, except uh, Scott's tracks headed north out of our Travis area, uh, my tracks headed south out of our Travis area. But uh, don't worry, I'm, we're both still definitely on the case. Uh, it is quite, as I said, quite cold this morning, so even all a lot of your herbivores and that are going to be moving later. Uh, so I don't think we've actually even seen an impala this morning. But we saw a Schlieven's blind snake, and that's a lot, a lot, lot, lot more rare than an impala. Gonna head up towards. We're heading up towards Treehouse Dam, and we're gonna check now the southern areas, see if we find any tracks. Scott, Scott, do you copy? Go ahead, Brent. Uh, Scotty, what area are you gonna be working now? Moving back towards where to the dam, there were tracks of the Manure where our muscles are cut down a little bit more than the article muscles are signed. But there were also tracks of the Mavazi here uh, uh, around that little link road, kind of down the great town. I'm interested in following up on. Kobe, thanks. I'm at Treehouse presently. I think I'm going to head up towards Zones and head to the busy car. Good. Just checking where Scotty was and what he's up to. Sounds like he's uh, on the on the tracks of a female leopard now. So fingers crossed, Scotty's hot on the trail. There's been lots and lots of answers um, uh, about what that snake possibly eats. Um, that snake is generally sort of more of a, a not an insectivore. They eat sort of uh, insects uh, under the ground as well as uh, things like slugs uh, and larvae of other of, of insects. Uh, so that, that's what the, the, that particular snake species eats. Sun's coming out nicely. Uh, it sounds like uh, almost all of you are on the right track with what that snake eats. So, well done to everyone. I'm gonna have to start asking some harder questions again. get a fright. Uh, Brian's going to wipe the lens quickly. Uh, it's that mist as we've dropped into the mist belt that is uh, making us look a bit blurry. So 
So temperatures definitely come up a little bit, a little bit more comfortable for us now. Hi Donna, uh, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Donna would just like to confirm what snake it was, and it is a Schliebelin's blind snake. And I'm pretty sure I saw a female leopard track. I did. I did see a female leopard track. See it there, Brian? Show me that. So on the on the right hand road track there, um, it's in, the sun's showing it nicely, but it's quite difficult because there are hyena and leopard tracks there. That is a hyena track. If we come back a little bit. There we go. There's the female leopard track. Sort of center of there we go. So um, it doesn't look too fresh, possibly from last night sometime, but definitely worth following up on. So we're going to see where these tracks might lead us. Gonzo of Mafazi uh, Ingwe um, heading north on Shabam Road and following up. Lots of hyena tracks as well. The hyena tracks look a bit more fresh there on top of the leopard tracks. So that's what makes me think earlier last night. I would actually have to concentrate a bit more. Whoops. Lots of hyena tracks making seeing the leopard tracks a bit more difficult. Let's go a bit slower. Don't want to miss where she cut off the road. Sunrise Safari. Uh, Dylan said he heard on a TV show that the leopard is supposed to be the most aggressive of the big cats in the world. Um, what do I think about that? Uh, Dylan, I don't actually agree with that statement 100%. Um, they are. This is going to be quite a difficult one to answer, Dylan. Um, so the term the big five uh, comes from the old hunting industry from the 1800s and it's the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot um, and a leopard is an incredibly dangerous animal um, when it is, is wounded. Uh, they are incredibly fast, they can charge sort of 24 meters a second um, and they normally charge from under under 10 meters so there's very little reaction time from a hunting point of view if you have wounded the animal and you're now following up but um, leopards will try avoid conflict with humans as much as possible um, even when we walk into them on foot the, the leopard because it relies on camouflage so even if we're tracking we spot the leopard you don't sort of point it and whatnot that sort of gives away um, the leopard's sort of main form of defense which is camouflage so 
normally if you spot a leopard when you're on foot and you and you track your leopard, you can even if the leopard's very close to you, three four meters from you, you just keep walking on like you haven't seen it. Um, uh, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. It's the most aggressive of the, the big cats in the world. Um, they don't normally actively hunt people. Um, they will obviously, they're opportunists if there's a small child in the village running around the edge. That is a nice easy target. Okay, we got back by nice step tracks again. Um, I would probably say it depends on your terms of aggression um, and from uh, towards a human point of view I would have to go with tigers are definitely the most uh, aggressive of the big cats um, and that's mostly because their humans form a huge part of their natural diet and also the areas where they occur are so heavily populated with people. Um, Lions as well, also humans form a, a natural part of their diet, but only at night. They will not try hunt a human during the day, uh, normally, and there's obviously different circumstances if an animal's wounded. Standing by. Sorry, I'm just going to take this on the radio. Copy, thanks very much, Orbs. Yeah, I'm at Shibam Junction with uh, Philemon's cut line. I'd like to join you there. So, uh, we've still got these leopard tracks. Sunrise Safari. Um, Edward would like to know. Sorry, Edward, let me just check with his tracks this way. Edward would like to know um, with male and female leopard tracks, uh, what, how do we tell the difference? And mostly it's the size, the shape is the same. But Edward's saying, well, couldn't it be a young male? Well, Edward, a young male, even before he's a year old, his feet are much bigger than his mother's. So it is quite easy to tell. Morning, Impalas. So, um, we, I just had a little birdie tell me something, so I'm gonna keep quiet for a little bit. Uh, sorry about not showing you the Impala, but we've got something much better in store. So, hold on. We're going on a Ferrari safari to get there. saying uh, a young male's got much bigger uh, tracks than his mother even when he's about eight nine months old um, and just with a male leopard the, the tracks are, are, are so much bigger than a female leopard obviously you can get a female leopard who's got very big tracks um, there was a, a female leopard we used to see quite regularly uh, when I worked in the south of the Sabi Sands um, and she had monstrous tracks I mean she had the same size tracks as an adult male um, but that was an uh, abnormal uh, rather than a norm and quite often we knew it was her just because of the area she frequented. We've got good luck in the mist. Well, I have good luck in the mist. We've had some fantastic sightings in the mist uh, this beginning of winter so far. Um, and I was actually saying to Brian uh, as we were heading out, I always feel like we've got luck in the mist. Oh, 
beautiful winter's morning. You can see it's warmed up a little bit. So I've lost my mitts. And I really do feel the cold, but I think Brian feels it more. He, he is wrapped up very tightly behind me. Oh, bouncy bounce. So the sun's going to burn off this mist. Uh, but it hasn't quite yet. Sunrise Safari. Uh, Sandy would like to know what makes what's been making Pula so um, inaccessible to us. Why has she been proving so difficult to find over the last few months? When in the past she's always been uh, the most common leopard seen and, and really accessible. Uh, could it be her age? The loss of the cub in December. Um, well, Sandy, I think it's a combination of, uh, of facts. I don't think the loss of the cub has anything to do with it. Um, but, oh, wildebeest and zebra, uh, we're going to scoot past them, but, and warthogs, but we will come back to them. Nice herd of zebra. We will definitely come back a little later and try to find them again. We know where they are. Bye, zebras. But Sandy, I think it's more to do with her age. She is getting quite old now. Um, and there does seem to be pressure from uh, younger female leopards. I mean, even even uh, her, her daughter, Shadow, seems to be coming further and further into um, uh, into, into Juma. Uh, and we saw that new female leopard down on the Buffalshook boundary, who's about 18 months old. So she's going to start getting independent and looking for uh, looking for territory. Um, also, there's been sh strange tracks down on the southern boundary. I'm not sure which leopard they belong to, but I know Karula was uh, seen in Buffalo's Hook and last night uh, around uh, around Wheelton Dam, and we had female leopard tracks coming all way, and those leopard tracks we're following now uh, are more than likely not cooler. They're coming from our south end. I do not know which leopard that might be. So maybe she's just feeling quite a lot of pressure from other leopards at the moment, and she is getting getting on in years. Just hang on a second, guys. Uri, I'm on Balanati's heading towards Impala Plants. What's my best access? What could it be? What could it be? Well, at least you guys know it's definitely not wild dog because um, we wouldn't be going this slow for wild dog. We would be doing some low flying. Uh, Brian would have to be putting a seatbelt on. Strange enough, uh, Sandy Backside, this is one of the first areas I ever saw Kruna, uh was around here. Uh, we're on Impala Plains at the moment. And we're now, oh, there we go. Um, and I haven't seen her in this area for, for quite some time. I think Scott had her here a while ago, but I mean, it must be over a month now. Um, here then? But it's very, very, very interesting behavior happening uh, with all the leopard movements at the moment and having all these tracks of animals we're not sure of who they might be in the area. There we go. We are here. Morning, 
کنین اون کام و عبز a nice little young male leopard. I'm trying to see where his mom is now. So who can tell me which leopard this is? Um, you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv. Or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. Who can identify which young male yeah, leopard this is? Close to the gate. Beautiful early morning light. I can't see where the female is just yet. But I'm sure she's around. better ways to spend a nice cool early morning than with a, with a leopard and especially now with this beautiful soft light that's coming through remember guys if you are new to the safari live concept we are live you're seeing this leopard in real time the same time we are and we are interactive so you can ask us questions about what we're seeing you can do that by sending an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter something um, we are quite close to the Arethusa boundary um, where him and his mom are normally seen Joe, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Um, Joe would like to know how old this leopard is. Joe, he's just over eight months now, um, so still indep still indep still dependent um, on his mother. Uh, male leopards tend to be dependent on their mothers for for longer uh, than female cubs. I mean, I've seen female cubs that will reach independence at as young as sort of 10, 11 months, where those male cubs will normally and start getting pushed away by the mother when they get to around four, between 14 and 16 months. But I have seen male cubs stay with their mother for as long as 22, 23 months. So at this age, it's not uncommon uh, for the females to leave them alone for an extended period, even up to three or four days. So she would probably be off hunting, she would try and make a, a kill and then she would preferably hoist the kill and then come back and, and fetch him and bring him back to wherever she might have taken that kill.
He is a very good looking youngster. You hear another vehicle on the way, uh, making their way into the sighting. Oh no, it's not. It's a vehicle going down the main road. The main access road. Thought they might be coming here, but... Morning, Trudy. Trudy would like to know how we identify leopards from their spot pattern markings. Um, I'll show you in a second, Trudy. So above the, the top line of whiskers, there's a very distinct spot pattern that is in, like a fingerprint to each leopard. Um, and just having a look quickly here, this uh, young male is a 3-3 spot pattern. And I will show you Let's just see what he's going to do for a second. I don't want to start showing you the back of my camera when you might do something interesting. So we look at the, the spot pattern on the top, so the last set of spots above the last line of whiskers. Um, and that's generally the easiest way. Uh, and if you look at ID kits for a lot of leopards that the lodges have that they give to new guides and stuff, that is how they will identify it from the top spot pattern. Um, I know a lot of you guys, or viewers like to use different distinguishing marks um, all over the body, um, but from our point of view, it's just for us a lot easier to have one system that we all we all stick to, um, and that is sort of the generally accepted system, and is also used um, in research projects and 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 that by scientists. Okay, let's have a quick look now. So there we go. I'm just going to get Brian to show you quickly here. So you see there, this is the right hand side of um, that young male's face, and you can see there's a very distinct one, two, three, um, let me just find a left hand profile, oops, I know I have one here, uh, oops, there we go, left hand profile. And there we go, that last line of spots above the whiskers, there's another one, two, three spots. So he's got a three, three spot button. It's going to be interesting to see how far it moves, or hopefully while we're here, his mom comes back. That would be a really nice sighting. Oh, we've got
Hi, Anne-Marie and Sharon. Welcome on the Samurai Safari. Uh, Anne-Marie and Sharon would like to know, is this a uh, young male old enough to make a kill, even if it is a small one? Uh, most definitely, Anne-Marie. He's probably already killed small things, possibly squirrels or dwarf mongoose. Sorry about that. Couldn't resist having to get that shot there. Uh, I think you got, got that one really nicely. Nice little leopard yawn. Um, but most definitely, um, maybe even possibly some Franklin. Off to our right, we'll stop there and then we'll move around in a second. Just want to see if he's going to move. So, moving into a slight, slightly cooler area, there's a drain system. I'm not sure whether he was getting really, really adventurous when he heard those impala um, rutting and decided he was going to go try. There he goes on the move again. Let's get around. He was going to try and take on a, an adult male impala at that age. It's not impossible, but just really highly unlikely. Him, bro. Which way did he go now? Oh, he's laid down in the drainage line. Just go forward a little bit. So guys, um, there's some other vehicles that are going to be wanting to come in here. We can always come back here a bit later, but I'm going to make space for the other vehicles and uh, we're going to come in a bit later. So we'll have one last little look and off we go. This has been really great being able to spend some time with the Shadows Cub. Um, been a really nice sighting. We nearly saw him catch a, a, a mouse, but... Um, we're going to make some space for the other vehicles that might want to come. Let me just call in. The station's going to be leaving two vehicles in this position of this uh, young Madore Ingwe. Um, best access is now from Triple M uh, to the north uh, east of uh, Impala Plains Junction with Triple M. So, 
um, while we try to maneuver ourselves out of here, um, we're going to cross across to Scotty, see what he's been up to, uh, and we'll be back with you a little bit later in the drive. Welcome back, and what a wonderful time you've been having with Prince and Shadow's Cub, and before that, seeing a snake. So, great action on Brent's vehicle this morning, which is good to hear. It hasn't been quite the same with myself and Andrew. We have been driving on all the roads with not too much life on them up till date. We spent about 10 or 15 minutes at Bufflesick Dam, watching the hippo and the heron, and allowing us some time to stop and listen to any signs of what may be happening around us. But it was silent, and we've now made our way south from there, hoping to bump into anything of interest. It's a absolutely beautiful morning, and the sun's beginning to warm us up now, and I'm sure it won't be long until we start peeling off the layers. and Andrew also headed back towards Voyatella Dam to spend some time scouting around there to try and establish where both the male leopard that was seen there in the early hours of this morning at the Juma Waterhole Dam, as well as the female's tracks that were heading towards the dam, We're trying to establish what happened to those animals but didn't have any luck in that area. It is very thick in certain parts around the dam and just didn't have any luck establishing where they may have gone. But good prospects for this afternoon, at least there are leopards moving around the property. But while we can't find the leopards, we can find some other animals like this very pretty little emerald spotted wood dove. <laughs> And you can see those emerald windows towards the back end of its wings. And as it turns and catches the sun at the right angle, you'll notice a, a bright sheen that glistens. There we go. Beautiful. These are tiny little doves. The only smaller one that we would get you would probably be the Namakwa dove. And this is about half the size of a Cape turtle dove, which is a more commonly known and regularly seen dove in this area. And again, it's stopping at times like this and enjoying a sighting of some of the less well-known characters that often can provide you with intelligence to find bigger animals. We could hear elephants breaking branches or monkeys alarm calling at something that they don't like the look of, all while enjoying watching this little bird go about its morning. It'll be feeding predominantly on grass seeds that would have fallen down from the blades of grass. Oh, 
a little wing stretch and what's it going to do next is it going to potentially dust bath there there's a small no it's just going to fly off good oh now this is interesting and we're going to stop here and get a visual of not one not two but three very very pretty birds of prey now it's not common to see three of these adults together and it takes about eight years for them to get their breeding plumage or adult plumage and i wonder what it is that's attracted all three of them to this area they are called battalures and we're going to try and get a little bit closer for two reasons to show you how pretty they are when we do get a little bit closer but also just to double check and make sure that there are no signs of a predator in the area because these birds do feed predominantly on carrion they can catch their own food but there are great indicators for us to help us find animals like leopards with their kills or any carcasses so let's try and make our way in a little bit closer and see what they are all doing there Just to keep you all updated on Brent's movements, he has sadly broken one of the brake lines, which can happen when you're off-roading, which he obviously has been following Shadow's Cub with all of you. So he's just heading in to get that fixed up. But hopefully that won't take too long to rectify but just to let you know what he's up to please may these battlers not fly away it will be such a beautiful sighting if they stay what will also be great is if they are in fact here because of a carcass of some sort getting ready to fly so we're just going to stop here before we try and get any closer and look at that for a beautiful beautiful sight bright red beaks and feet now You can identify these birds of prey or in terms of their gender simply by looking at them even when they are sitting down like this it's a little bit easier when they're flying i can tell that the bird on the top is a male and the two below i cannot tell because of the way they are sitting but as they move from side to side that should become clear to us and what I'll do is I'll get the picture in the book ready to show you how to distinguish between male and female. Now, I have a close look at the bachelor on the right here. And you'll notice that below this creamy shoulder feathers, you could say, the trailing edge is black, where my finger is now, whereas on the female, there'll be a gray panel on the trailing edge, which appears white when the female is flying. 
and the male is half black, half white. So now as Andrew will take you back to the bachelor sitting in the tree, you will clearly see that the one on the top has got the black trailing edge. The two on the side we cannot see because they're facing us. But they could well swivel around at some stage. Now, the reason why I said it was strange to have three adults together is that they are monogamous, so they form pairs for life. And to find three adults together is very strange. Like I said, it takes about eight years for them to get their adult plumage, so it won't be two adults with one of their recent offspring. And the male certainly seems to be peering down at what could be two females below it, very intently. And like a lot of the animals, especially the birds at this time of the year, they spend the first few hours of the day relaxing, basking in the sunshine, warming up, and the birds of prey will be in no rush because for them to be able to fly around effort effortlessly it requires hot thermals to be rising off the earth as the earth warms up they can then ride these warm thermals of air spiraling up from the ground allowing them to fly very efficiently and not waste much energy but at the moment it's not quite warm enough to do that yet so that's what they're waiting for. Unless, of course, there is something nearby, a kill of sorts. But I don't think so. I think this is just a comfortable tree that they've decided to spend the night in. If we saw them sitting in a tree that would be less easy for them to land in or sit in, we could then assume that it would be more likely for a kill to be nearby. And because this is such a abnormal sighting that there are three adults around, I'm going to get out my camera that's been in hospital for the last few weeks, and this will be the first few shots I fire off after months of not having taken any photographs, which I'm looking forward to. Beautiful. We'll see if we can try and get a little bit closer. Now that we've let them relax with our presence at this distance, we can try and See if we can get you a slightly closer image. Okay, well, we've just got an update from Bob saying that she thinks the one on the right is a female. And thanks for sending through that update, Bob. I'm guessing that's the one now that's just flown up closer to the male on the top of this dead tree. And I haven't been able to get a 
good glimpse of the white wing panels of that now that it is sitting at a slight angle it looks like bob is indeed correct yeah so well done bob thanks very much for sending that through and obviously bob's been taking notes of all the little pointers and lessons we give along the way and now we can see the one on the bottom left is oh it looks like a male yeah yeah the one on the left is a male so two males one female very interesting well i can't explain that maybe the male on the left has lost its mate maybe it's trying to steal this mate from the male we can see we'll never know the answer but really pretty sighting this is to have three of them together and as i said it is warming up and you may have just heard my zip being drawn down as I am going to take my jacket off now. Well, now that we had a close look at them, and I think it's fairly safe to say that there's no carcass in this area. I think we'll move off and see what else we can find. Very good. Very, very good. Bachelors, even though you didn't alert us to a kill this morning, I'm sure one day you will. And regardless of that, it was a really pretty sighting and a unique one to see three of them all perched together. to show you it's, it's inactive at the moment but it's still something very interesting an interesting relationship that is had between a bird and an insect now as i've said it's no longer active but what you will see here is a bird's nest and to the left of the bird's nest it almost looks like snake skin this gray matter that's it a abandoned wasps nest and even though there's no wasps there now in summer when this blue wax bill would have built its nest it's a very small little bird it would have been searching for the wasps called vespid wasps before it built its nest and it would have done this because it knows that these wasps are highly aggressive and if it builds its nest very close to the wasps nest any intruders like snakes or mongooses or bigger birds trying to raid the nest will be attacked by its own private security system and isn't that a wonderful relationship of an interesting relationship how one specific bird has realized the benefits of building its nest close to the wasps and we did see one or two in summer when these little blue wax bulls were nesting and all these little relationships that we have out here are so wonderful and so many of them we don't know about or are too small for us to understand but that certainly is a great example of how clever a lot of the animals are and how much they rely on other animals in order for them to succeed
Since I've been radio down, are there any updates? that we aim to, to get to. A lot of the time, as you may well know, we don't always complete planned routes or destinations as we never know what we're going to bump into along the way. And I hope that's the case this morning. But failing bumping into anything exciting, we will be heading towards Twin Dams. We're currently situated in the southeastern corner of the property and don't really have too many other areas to work other than back into Vuyatela via Twin Dams. And if we do make it there, we may have one or two little patchy moments as there are a few low signal areas that we have to get through in order to continue on with our morning's adventure. So I'll pre-warn you about those little technical glitches that may come up. And because it's just... Myself and Andrew out now, Brent and Brian are trying to fix a broken brake line on their vehicle. We will not have the pleasure of crossing across to them if the signal does get a bit patchy. for any of you who may be joining for the first time this is a live safari so it's happening this very second and if you would like to get involved and ask us any questions please feel free to do so and to do that you would hashtag safari live on twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv appreciate all the questions you do send through so thank you for that in advance
beautiful big dead tree is home to a variety of different animals that seek shelter in the cavities within the tree. And one of the residents are the tree squirrels, of which we can see one. Just like the battlers enjoying the morning sunshine. I've also seen brown-headed parrots investigating some of the cavities in these trees for a possible nesting site, as well as Birchall starlings. So, a keystone structure for the small animals, as without this dead tree, these small animals wouldn't have a home. And it's an iconic tree of this area called the Leadwood tree. As its name suggests, it's very heavy wood and very hard wood. And this dead tree could stand for hundreds of years and withstand most weather conditions and even fires, depending on the nature of the fire. They can often withstand fire and stand for hundreds of years. The squirrel doesn't have to worry about its home decaying or being broken down by termites, as a lot of the other trees would be in this area. Thank you to George Ann in Illinois who sent through the collective noun for a group of eagles and it's called a convocation of eagles. So thank you very much for sharing that with us, Joanne. And I hope you enjoyed the earlier sighting of that wonderful convocation of battleers. Oh, look at that big stretch. That was awesome. <laughs> Well, that's one very happy squirrel with not a worry in the world. And always funny to see the smaller animals like a squirrel stretching and yawning. Another funny one to watch is a warthog. When warthogs yawn, they can hardly open their mouth, so it's a very narrow mouthed gape. <laughs> which can be quite funny to experience. And hopefully we'll find the den sites of some warthogs and be able to show you that. They typically are quite late risers and will lie at the entrance to their burrow for a few hours before they head out. We've just got a question through from Charlie in Minnesota. Good morning, and thanks for sending your question through. Charlie's interested to know whether we get any eland in this area. And sadly we don't, Charlie. They are such awesome antelope, and I'm actually going to find a picture of one in the book for you to show all the other viewers what, what exactly an eland is. It's a massive, massive antelope. That's part of the spiraled horned antelope family, so similar to kudu, inyala, and bushbuck. And they do occur in various parts of the Kruger National Park, but not where we are here. They occur further to the north. And they are massive, massive animals, really, really pretty. Both male and female have got horns. And... If you look up at that little picture over there, it gives you an idea of how big they are relative to 
a human, and in terms of weight, the males can be huge, 700 to 900 kilograms. So you basically double that to get the weight in pounds. Now we can hear a very interesting bird calling, and I think we're actually going to be able to show it to you just over to our left. You can hear it calling. It's just to the right of the tree. I don't know if Andrew's further enough forward. No, I'm going to have to roll forward a little bit. Sorry, Andrew, let me just creep forward a little bit. Awesome. Now, I'm going to leave this one up to you guys to identify. I don't think I've ever showed you one, but Brent or Mark may have in the past. It does look similar to one other bird that I know we have showed you, and that's the only clue I'm going to give you. So send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And I'm interested to know which of you will be the first to get this bird right. It's seldom that we actually get to show you the bird whilst it's calling. So this is a bonus, especially because it's a bird that we don't see very often or don't get to show you very often. We do get fleeting glimpses of them flying past. But certainly not quite as good as this. An opportunity is available very often. As you can see, this squirrel has now made its way further down the tree, and it may be warm enough now to start its morning morning foraging for snacks. They feed on a variety of seeds and nuts, and often have to forage through old piles of elephant dung in order to try and find these little nuggets of goodness. It will also have a stash within these natural cavities that it's poking its head out of now to keep it going through the winter, but it'll be continually working to try and maintain a well-packed pantry in case of tough times that may lie ahead. for the squirrel to make its move and also wait for you guys to send through which bird it is that we can still hear calling. It's flown off into a different tree, but you certainly would have had long enough to have a good look at it. But we've got a question through from Shanae. And good morning and thanks for sending your question through. Shanae is interested to know why there appear to not be very many female guides around? And that's a great question, Shanae. It certainly is an industry that's openly accessible to ma males, females, young, old, 
uh, people from other countries. So there's no prejudice or factors that would make it more difficult for a, a, a female or a foreigner to become a guide. And I think it's often simply a lack of interest from those genders. I know at a lodge where I used to work, 25% of our team was female staff. So there certainly it may be certain lodges which are more inclined to employ female guides. But if you break it down and determine that, or just realize that, there's no difference between a male or female when it comes to doing this job. As long as you can drive a car around and look at animals and talk to them and entertain your guests, anyone can do it. But it is a good point. There aren't as many females as males, not even close. And I think it is fair to say that over the years it is becoming more common for ladies to be guides. But why there aren't more, I'm not entirely sure. I know a lot of lodges like to incorporate females into their guiding team to create a balance. And it, from my experience, does create a great balance to have some female guides on the team. And at a lodge where I spent the majority of my guiding career, we always had three or four female guides out of the team of 16. But interestingly enough, on this topic, it's often women that arrive as tourists and complain when they've got a female guide. So that's something to, to, to think about. Um, my, my friends who are female guides often have the most trouble from other females as the, the woman who would arrive wouldn't feel safe being driven around by a female. It obviously makes no sense whatsoever. And in the tourist defense, it's possibly because they would have just imagined and expected to have a male guide picking them up at the airstrip and then be a little bit taken aback by uh, a small dainty blonde ar arriving to pick them up. So. It is what it is, but there are no reasons holding back women from becoming guides, and that's important for everyone to know. Good, well, we're going to leave that squirrel to it. It seems like it may be a little bit cautious of our presence, and that's what may be stopping it from disembarking the tree. And also an update on Brent's vehicle, sadly, it sounds like the damage is a little bit worse than expected, so they're going to be working on it for longer than expected, and we'll probably not be out again on the Sunrise Drive. Now we're about to go through a dip, so the signal may be a little bit jumpy, but don't go anywhere because it will recover shortly after we climb up onto some higher ground. Here goes. Well, I hope you're all still there. It does vary from day to day, interestingly. And signal and broadcast strength does keep us on our toes. It always keeps us guessing and fluctuates slightly. Now, even though it has started warming up ever so slightly, now it's not very hot yet, so it'll be interesting to see if there are any visitors to the water hole that we're approaching.
I've been radio down. Are there any updates? mammals at the waterhole, but there are a few birds fluttering about. Well, to those of you who said green wood hoopoo, you were very close for the ID quiz we had earlier and well done for getting that close it's not the green wood hoopoo or red billed wood hoopoo it's a very close relative called a common simitable so very well done to those of you who did get the common simitable correct and i'll bring it up in the book here now you'll notice that the green wood hoopoo is here and it does have a very similar beak structure and body shape and color to the common simitable. The main thing is that the common simitable's beak is black. And it's also slightly smaller than the red-billed wood hoopoo or green wood hoopoo. And on top of that, common simitables will very often travel alone. So you seldom see them in large groups. But the green wood hoopoe is very commonly in large family groups of anywhere from two to ten birds in this area. Very, very well done to those of you who got that correct. And wasn't that great to also hear it calling. The call of the uh, green wood hoopoe is also a very loud cackling call, so different to the call of the common simitable. It's quite common to find hornbills around the water holes at this time of the year. And what they'll be doing is disturbing termites who are busy trying to break down that, those piles of elephant dung and the hornbills will come in and use their beak to topple over the dung that the termites will be feeding on from the bottom up that way exposing the termites and that's exactly what it's feeding on now tiny little termites high in protein amazes me how accurate they are with that relatively big beak of theirs they're picking up here we go here we can see it's trying to knock over some of these bits of dung to expose the termites to their business here and see what else we can find there's just about 20 minutes left and plenty of time to find something let's just see what is out and about Yes, she's now crossed over into the uh, 
Apologies for the game drive <coughs> channel that you can all hear. It's a bit of a catch-22 because if we turn it off and you don't hear it, then we also don't hear any updates that could lead us to animals. So, not ideal, but hopefully it will be rectified at some stage in the near future. Being out in these remote places makes getting things fixed a little bit tricky. direction to us here, but I think Brent was following these tracks a little bit earlier and appeared to, I think, cross south out of our property. So many leopards walking around this property, but we just can't seem to find them. Well, I guess our timing was off because a lot of them would have been moving last night. When we are not on drive, try and understand a little bit more their habits and movements to hopefully track them down on another occasion. since I've been back, or a very small amount of it. And again, I haven't seen too many impalas, so it could be a combination of the fact that they may have moved off our property ever so slightly, but they should still be rutting in full swing. And I'm hoping to get one or two last glimpses of them doing it. It really is, I find it entertaining to watch. I'm not sure what it's been like in the few days that I've been gone, but we didn't manage to show you much of Didn't the show manage to show you much of the Impala rutting this season? Consistently there. I thought I'd stop and make sure that it's of nothing of int any interest to us. Thank <laughs> you. 
can't seem to see anything there. a question through from Georgie, I think it is, asking which kind of styling it was that we saw earlier. Oh, Shorty. Hello, Shorty. And apologies for not letting you know what that was. It was a virtual styling that we saw briefly at the dam earlier. It's the largest of the starlings that we get in this area. Quite common for us to see, especially around the water holes. I'm guessing that <coughs> there could well be some more virtual starlings at the water hole we're about to stop at up ahead. And there we'll be able to give you a closer look at them. Having a tree house dam very shortly, and I know Brent was here earlier this morning. But the beauty of driving around this place is that things change, and even though you may check one road or another vehicle may drive down one road, you could drive down 10 minutes later and find a completely different scenario unfolding. Let's see if that's the case this morning. You guys will have a much better idea of what was here when Brent drove past earlier than I will. approaching. He was looking quite intently to the right, but on closer inspection I've noticed another buffalo also approaching the dam. And there could well be a steady stream of buffalo heading towards this water hole during the day. It is common for them to rest up here in the heat of these winter days. And Shorty, you'll notice there's another virtual starling. It's just in front of the buffalo. And the buffalo is slowly walking towards it. There it is, it's very far away, but even from here you can tell that it's a virtual starling simply from its size and very long tail. The other starlings we get here, the greater blue-eared and glossy, are considerably smaller. Okay, well, just 10 minutes left to go, and seeing as though the buffalo appears to be leaving the water hole, I think we shall follow suit and do the same thing.
I can take a closer look at this big old boy. He appears to be blind in his right eye. And you'll notice it's an opaque color. And I think it's safe to assume that vision out of his right eye is non-existent, so he's probably only relying on his left eye. I could be wrong. But it is a disability that at the moment you can see has very little effect on, on him. He's still big and strong and healthy. Having one eye doesn't make it more difficult for him to find food. It will certainly, though, make things a little bit more difficult as he becomes older and weaker when it comes to facing off lion. But it's incredible how animals can adapt and recover from injuries out here and what would usually be an injury that would cause a lot of difficulty to animals like us humans. These wild animals are incredibly resilient. see some zebra hoofs on this road. The tracks don't look very fresh. But good to know that there have been some zebra moving along here. It may simply be that a vehicle's already driven here this morning that way, giving me a false indication as to how fresh they are. But there's not many zebra around this area, especially at this time of the year. So good to know that there are still a few lurking about. Andrew, can you not see, see this one just down here? Mm. Uh, there it is there. It's getting, it's getting difficult to point our tracks. It is just... Yeah, that one I can't see. Too close. Yeah, a bit too close. Oh no. Yeah. Well, there are tracks of a leopard heading down the road here. It's not easy for us to show you, but we are going to continue heading in this direction. It could be tracks from the female whose tracks we had around Weirtella Dam this morning. Either way, the 
methods are out and about, which is great. It's just we need to somehow manage to find them now. And there's a whole bunch of students here who are busy examining the different tracks. So that's why there's an empty car in the middle of the road. And they're out all the way from America. And the university students, which are busy doing some assessments and some training. Ouch, and that must be so much fun for them. So quite envious of them on their morning out. Morning, Lee. How are you doing? You guys? Good. Certainly, there are some good prospects for this afternoon with all the leopard tracks on the, on the property. They could hopefully position themselves in an easier place for us to find them through the course of the day. Failing that, there could be a lot of things that change. Elephants could come onto the property. There doesn't appear to be any sign of elephants around. Anyway, I hope you've all enjoyed your sunrise safari with us. And I know there was a lot of excitement on Brent's vehicle with not only a great leopard sighting, but also that sighting of a snake, which is an animal that we don't get to see too often out here. So we're really happy about that, that you got to see some good quality and different sightings. I'm not sure exactly who's going to be out on drive this afternoon. It could well be James and Brent, but we'll see you all then. Have a good one.